If you have a Bible with you, I want to invite you to open up to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 is where we're going to be. We are continuing in our series this morning that we have called Go for the Gold. All right, it's a pretty simple idea. Right now, we have athletes from all over the world competing in the Olympics in hopes of winning a gold medal and being the best in the world at what they do. All right, and they've spent thousands of hours preparing for this moment. Uh, their dedication to their sport is basically unparalleled, kind of in our modern day, uh, by almost anything else. All right, I'm not going to go in and ask how many of you guys watched the Olympics this week, because I did that last week, and you guys all hate the Olympics. All right, I was like the only one. So in the first week of this series, uh, we looked at a passage from 1 Corinthians, and, and Paul said this, and this passage is important because it kind of sets up this whole series. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, he says, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. All right, Paul's saying these athletes are so incredibly dedicated, and they put in tons of time and effort and work, and for what? A prize that will waste away. Like, if they're lucky, they get a little piece of metal. If they're lucky, like, that, sorry, not lucky, if they're good. There's not too many Olympic events that are based on luck. All right, and, and Paul's saying these, they are so incredibly dedicated. As followers of Jesus, we are running after a prize that is eternal, that will never fade away. And considering this, shouldn't we be putting in even more work than they are? That's what he's saying. Shouldn't we be doing even more? But most Christians nowadays, I, I don't think we could describe our walk with Jesus in the same terms that an elite athlete describes their dedication to their sport. So we've been following this idea of athletics and dedication using modern day Olympic events to parallel what our walk with Jesus should look like and we are going to continue that today. All right, now I'm excited for today. I think that uh, today has, it has the potential for some of us in the room, to really change the way that we look at life and approach life. All right, and it could be a game changer for you in the way that you live every day. All right, and so I'm, I'm excited for this. I want us to be ready just for God to speak to us and say, all right, you know what, we, we need a new outlook. We need a new view on how we do this. So let's be ready to hear from God. Uh, if you're willing, if you're able, would you stand with me across the room as we read our passage today? So we are in John chapter 16. This is starting in verse 31. Jesus asked, do you finally believe? But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. God, we pray that you would just right now begin to soften our hearts. Lord, make us ready for whatever it is that you want to speak to each one of us individually. God, we pray that these would be your words that we are hearing this morning. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Do we have any former, or I guess current, track stars, we'll lower that, track runners in the room? Okay, we got a few, we got a few. Or maybe you just like to run for fun. All right, there's something wrong with you people. All right, okay. I, I, has anyone participated cross country? Anyone done a marathon? Okay, we got some marathon people in the room. That's impressive. All right, running is one of those competitions that it's just like so pure, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's just running. It's classic. It's basic. It's elementary. It's what you do on the playground in elementary. Like, let's just run, all right? Let's see who's the fastest, all these different things. Like, running is just so, so pure. I don't enjoy running. All right, like I, I need something to do. So I join soccer because then I at least can chase a ball. All right, and, and there's like something to do. In, in high school, I also played tennis, uh, but our school was kind of poor and they ended up cutting the program. So my spring sport of tennis was cut. So instead I joined track because I love to run. No, because they missed a lot of school. 
all right? And I've said that before, and I just, I'm not ashamed of it, all right? But I couldn't just run, even in track. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not just going to run around this track. So the things that I did, uh, I, I was like a long jumper, all right, which I wasn't very good at. I'm pretty short. All right, I was a long jumper, then I did the triple jump, because that's like long jumping but cheating. You just get to keep jumping, all right? And then I did do a relay, because at least then I have like a baton in my hand, and I'm like chasing somebody, right? And then the, the last thing I did was I joined hurdles, all right? They were not this big. <laughs> this is actually the height of, of men's 110. I don't know if you knew that, but the, the height of the hurdles change based on how long you're running and who's doing the running and the age they are. That's crazy. Um, and, and hurdles is interesting. All right? It is essentially just running a race with barriers and obstacles in your way. Like that, that's what it is in its most simple form. All right, and hurdles started somewhere between 18, or around 1830, and when it started, it was, we will say, very primitive, all right? It wasn't our modern hurdles that we have today. It started as just wooden barriers, okay? Like, so you look at this bottom corner, like, that's just like a pallet. Like, they just put, like, pallets out there or something, and they started jumping over them. So you can see these different hurdles that they had, uh, um, and if you ran into a hurdle, okay, look at these ones. If you ran into this hurdle... The hurdle is not going down. You are going down. All right? Like, you are going to be stopped dead in your tracks. They were not forgiving. Well, hurdles became pretty popular, and they made it into the first modern Olympics in 1896. But prior to the first Olympics, they changed the design of the hurdle, made it a little bit more forgiving. And I believe that's kind of almost what you see, kind of maybe bottom left, top right. It's still, though, it has a brace on the other side. If you hit it, it's not really going anywhere. But it's a little more forgiving than a pallet. All right, so, and then actually, 1935, they developed this L shape that they have here, and, and if you have ran hurdles before, you don't run this way, you run this way, so that if you hit them, they kind of fall, but they're weighted, they're pretty heavy, and they became a little more forgiving. Well, when this happened, people became a lot more strategic in the way that they ran hurdles, all right? It wasn't just running and jumping over something. All right, they started to map things out better. Like you can see, um, especially this bottom left one, like people used to when they jumped over hurdles, they basically just kind of tucked their feet underneath them and, I don't know, did that. And you can tell, like, you're not going to get very high doing that. So this new design comes, and they start being a lot more strategic in the way they do it. All right, and they would want to just barely pass over the hurdle. Like coaches would tell them, like, even if, if your leg can just kind of kiss it, almost. Like, you want to be as low as you can because that's going to shave off more time. You're going to be faster. You're not jumping up and over. You're almost just kind of running and, and leaping across it. All right? So, we have seen scriptures that talk about our lives like a run. Uh, but if you're older than probably about eight years old, you know that, that life is not just a smooth sailing run in your lane. Right? Like, there are obstacles. There are obstacles in our life. Our passage that we opened with was Jesus and one of the promises that he gives us, uh, his followers. And he promises that we will have trials and sorrows, is what we read. Other translations will say, you will have trouble, you will have distress, you will have suffering, oppression, affliction, difficulties, persecution. Life will be tough. How many of us are excited about this promise from Jesus? Right, like, yeah, that's the promise I'm going to cling to. That sounds great. It doesn't matter. It's a promise, whether we like it or not. Like, this is what we are told. And I have found this to be personally true for me. Uh, and it's not just Jesus that says this. All over in the New Testament letters, it is talked about as a guarantee that we will have obstacles. It's, it's just a given. Second Timothy says, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So we will have obstacles. We will have barriers. That is a guarantee in your life and in my life. Sometimes those barriers are, of our, are our own making. Right? Like we make a dumb choice. And all of a sudden we have some obstacles in our life. Uh, we choose to live a certain way. We, we make a trade-off in life. We make one decision and there's, I don't even want to say consequences because not all barriers are consequences. Sometimes it's just you make this choice. Well, this is what happens. This is the outcome. These are the things that are now in your life. 
Sometimes we just have natural barriers in our life. Maybe because of the family that you were born into. There are certain barriers that the person sitting next to you maybe doesn't have. Sometimes because we just live in a fallen world and there's sickness and disease and death and, and all sorts of things. That there, there are barriers. Sometimes other people are actively trying to hinder us. If you've ever been there, someone is trying to sabotage your life. You have a coworker that just has it out for you. Or maybe Satan is actively trying to hurt you. Like we, we see that in scripture. But I want to do this today. I want us to understand a few things about this so that we can live our lives uh, in a way that understands that we will have obstacles, but our walk with Jesus isn't hindered by them. Right? Like I think we can live our life in that way. Now, normally I try and make sure that my messages have a singular passage that we look at and we dive into and we look at the context and who wrote it, who did they write it to, why did they write it, what was the context of it, uh, what did it mean to the first readers. That is incredibly important to do. All right, so much damage can be done by just taking little verses out here and there and making them say what we want. All right, uh, people use scripture to support what they think instead of allowing scripture to form how they think. And that can happen. And so we try and avoid that by really just sticking on one scripture and diving into it. But today, I'm going to use a few verses from a few different spots. And I believe that they're going to be in the appropriate context. But I'm not going to be going into all of that context for us today. All right, And I'd actually even go as far as saying is if you feel like there's a verse today that is used outside of that context and is used inappropriately, please call me, email me, message me. Let's talk about it. Like we, we always want to make sure that we are true to what the Bible says and we aren't twisting any scripture to make it say what we want it to say. Because you can do that. You can make an argument with just about, for just about anything by grabbing scripture and doing that. All right, so that's a quick side note. We know that we are guaranteed difficulties. We're going to have obstacles. As we run our race, there are going to be hurdles in our lane. But there are some things that we can do to make this work for us, all right? The first one is this, if you're taking notes. We need to glean from each hurdle. Now, this word glean might sound weird, like I was just trying to be smart, and I typed in something else to a thesaurus and grabbed that one. Uh, but I chose this for a reason, right? Like, I, I kind of wanted to say we need to grow. I, I kind of wanted to say we need to learn. And I feel like glean kind of pulls those two together a little bit better. Uh, actually, the word glean comes from the idea of picking up leftover grain. Like someone goes out and cuts grain, and there's grain left over. Gleaning is picking that up and adding it to what you have. Actively going out, making that choice to pick it up, add it to what you have. All right? I don't think we always naturally just grow from difficulties. We need to make a decision to grow and learn from it. So every time we face a difficulty, every time we face a hurdle in our life, we need to learn and grow because of it. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So when something happens in our lives, when something bad happens, when we have a hurdle, God is talking what could have been bad or is bad, and he is causing it to have a, a positive effect in our life as well. And we don't always see that, usually because we are so focused on the negative situation in our life that we don't see the potential positive that could be happening there. All right, and so we need to shift our perspective. We need to see things differently. For someone who runs hurdles, the more they do it, the more they practice, the better they will get. All right, it's just like anything else in life. Every hurdle that they jump over will now make them better and more prepared for the next hurdle. Does that make sense? All right, and before they ever run in a race, they have probably passed over thousands of hurdles. Every time we face a difficulty, if we are gleaning from that experience, we will be more prepared for the next one. In fact, we should reach a place where we are expecting the next hurdle. We know it's coming, right? We are promised this in our life, so let's be ready for it. That way, our faith in God isn't completely shaken every single time some difficulty happens because we are expecting it. And that, that brings us to our second point, and that's this. We need to be strategic about how we face hurdles. So as we pass each hurdle, 
As you jump over a hurdle in your life, you are learning, you are gleaning from the past experience that you just had. All right? But when our feet hit the ground and start running, we should be looking ahead and getting ready for the next one. When you run hurdles, you have what's called a lead leg and you have your trail leg. All right? Uh, and your lead leg is the one that goes over the hurdle first. If you can picture how people kind of hurdle nowadays, the lead leg goes over first. The, the trail leg is the one that's kind of bent up behind you. And when the runner gets over the hurdle, the lead leg comes over first and it snaps down to the ground. And that trail leg is already rotating and moving to start running again. Does that make sense? So they're all ready to go. So they get over the hurdle, the leg snaps down, they start running. They take off going. All right? And when they take off running, it isn't just sprinting. All right? I don't know if you knew this, but you don't run as fast as you possibly can between each hurdle. There's more to it than that. There's planning and strategy that goes into this. These two hurdles right here, they are set up at about the, the distance that they would be apart in a 110 meter hurdle race for men. This, this is the distance that you would have. That looks like a pretty good distance. Now when they jump over this one and they hit the ground, they actually plan out how many steps are going to happen between one hurdle and the next, if you do not know this about hurdles. And if you are an elite athlete, your steps is three. Some of you are looking at this and you're like, you, you said the wrong number or you put them up at the wrong distance. Three. And what three does is it allows you to have the same lead leg each time you go over. If you do four steps in between here, you have to now switch legs every time you jump. So they, they do three steps in between there. All right, And they purposely, you don't want to get too close to the hurdle. If I'm running this way, I'm going to be way off the camera, that's fine. If I'm right here, now I am jumping up and over the hurdle. If I jump from here, you are more so going to be right over it. Like there, there's strategy and purpose into how people do hurdles. It's not just running as fast as you can. So they plan out these steps. All right, A hurdle is never unexpected in a hurdle race. They don't just pop up out of the track willy-nilly all of a sudden. There isn't someone sitting on the side like sliding them out in front of you. Like, we're going to get them next time. Like, that would be crazy. But it's never unexpected. They know I am in a hurdle race. There are hurdles. I should be looking for the next hurdle. We are in a hurdle race. All right, and when we begin to be strategic about hurdles... We expect them to come. We are ready for them. We are learning from them. We are preparing for the next one. You can see every difficulty can have purpose in our lives. But whether it has purpose in your life or not is up to you. Like you actually get to choose if something bad happens, if it's just something negative in your life, or if you can look back on it and say there, there was purpose. There was something that happened. God did something using that event. We have to have the right mindset. Romans 5 says this, verse 3, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength and character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Each hurdle can help us grow. It creates and builds new things in us. But not if we give up and act defeated every single time something happens in our life. So here's what we do. We expect difficulties... As each one comes, we learn from it. We look for how God might be working through a really crummy situation in our life. Then as we come out the other side, we try to keep moving forward on the path that God has us on, that he's leading us on, and we begin to expect the next one coming. That way we aren't caught by surprise and off guard. That way we keep moving forward, learning from it, seeing God move through it. And life is like this over and over all right, sounds exhausting. Life can be exhausting sometimes. How I many you guys know that there are exhausting seasons in life? Usually they coincide when there's a lot of hurdles in life. But when we have the right perspective, we just keep following the lane that God has put us in. He gives us the strength to move forward. Now, I'm not downplaying some of the difficulties in life either. All right? 
uh, we hit really difficult things. When, when a close loved one passes away, something big, traumatic in our life happens, I don't want us to think that what I'm saying here is, you just jump over it and keep running and don't care. That, that's not what I'm saying. All right? I'm not saying that we are callous to the things that happen around us. I'm saying, in light of what we know, in light of, like what we said last week, in light of the realities of heaven, as Paul says, where our eyes are supposed to be, we keep our focus on God. Right? Like we mourn, we grieve, we take the time we need, but we also remember and understand that even in a terrible situation, God can use it for good. And we try to have a perspective that takes in all of eternity in the midst of the situations that we are in presently. Now, all of this up to this point has focused just on ourselves. And real quickly, there's, there's another part of this that we see in Scripture, and I want to I touch on this. There are people, billions of people, running their race in the lanes next to us. And Scripture actually talks a lot about our responsibility to those other runners. It talks about how we impact those around us that are followers of Jesus and those that aren't followers of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6 these aren't even going to be on the screen. There's so many of them. I'm going to read through them fast. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. And no one will find fault with our ministry. 1 Corinthians 8. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. Later in that chapter. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. That sounds awful. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Romans 14, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. In the book of Acts, James gets up in front of the other apostles. And Paul and Barnabas have been talking about how the Gentiles are finding Jesus. And it's this amazing thing, non-Jewish people finding Jesus. And they're talking about this, and should we make them follow all of our stuff? Should we not? And James gets up and he says this, and so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. It shouldn't be difficult for them to find Jesus. Right? Like, there were people that were saying they need to follow all of our rules. Everything we have for eating, everything that we have for cleanliness, everything that we have for worship, they need to follow our circumcision rules, everything like this. They're trying to put all of this on the Gentiles, and they're saying, no, stop Stop putting hurdles in front of other people. Especially when they aren't necessary. So as followers of Jesus, we need to not be putting stumbling blocks or hurdles in front of others. Believers or non-believers. Well, how do we do that? Usually we do it by adding to the gospel. All right? We add extra requirements to be saved that aren't actually in the Bible. You might be thinking, that's terrible. Who would do that? Well, we do it all the time. Like, we don't realize it sometimes. All right? Many times we take this small truth or a good idea and we blow it up into this big thing and think everybody should follow this. All right? If you want to be a follower of Jesus, you have to act this certain way. Well, yeah, okay. Scripture talks about the way that we should live and we probably should look different from the rest of the world. The way we act should look different, for sure. But are we allowing somebody to actually have the time for the Holy Spirit to work in them and the Holy Spirit to be the one that's prompting them to live in a different way? Or are we saying from the get-go, like when you walk through the doors of our church, this is what you need to look like? I don't think that happens as often anymore. Kind of like there used to be this thing, like when you go to church, you have to dress like this. You have to look this way. You have to wear your Sunday best. That's, that's nowhere in the Bible. Now, I've talked with people, and they have a good heart. They're like, I want to give my best to God. I'm like, that's awesome. You keep doing that then. But stop telling other people that they have to do that. It's not in the Bible anywhere. That's, it's, it's not a thing. We had board members at my last church that, like, we had challenged them. We want you to be inviting people to church. One guy came back. He said, I invited several of my coworkers. You know what every single one of them said? I know how your church dresses, and I don't have the right clothes. Does that just break your heart? That someone can't find Jesus because they don't have the right clothes? Our pastor actually was like, all right, I'm going to stop dressing the way that I'm dressing. Like, I like dressing this way. I like dressing up. But I'm going to start wearing other clothes if it means people will find Jesus. Because we are unknowingly putting hurdles in front of people. All right, one of the biggest ones nowadays. If you're a Christian, you have to vote a certain way. 
Now understand that there are some things that have become political and part of our world that the Bible has a lot to say about. Absolutely. So we should be listening to the Bible. But unfortunately, neither political party in the U.S. is based on Jesus. So neither of them perfectly line up. Right? Like we have a broken system, a system that isn't built on Jesus, and we are trying to walk out our faith inside of a broken system. And that's why you hear followers of Jesus on both sides screaming very loudly about the issues that are very close to their heart. And people say, how can you vote for that party when they stand for this, this, and this? And then the other party yells the same thing back. How can you vote for that party when they stand for this, this, and this? It's okay to have beliefs and convictions, and it's okay to vote based off of those. All right, I want us to understand that. That's okay. What is not okay is to tell someone that they cannot be a Christian, they cannot follow Jesus, if they don't vote the same way as you. It causes one more hurdle to be in the way of people finding Jesus. Our world and society is built on divisions, and we need to be careful to not deepen those divisions, especially if it would hinder someone from finding Jesus. All right, we trust that the longer we follow Jesus, the longer we run this race, the more we grow, the more the Holy Spirit works in us, and hopefully the more we look like Jesus and not look like this world. But if we aren't careful, we end up throwing hurdles in front of other people and making it way more difficult for them to either follow Jesus or even to find Jesus. Can we stand across this place? Taylor, you can come. In this past little section, the last two minutes here, you might be upset. <laughs> there might be more than a few people in the room that are not happy with some of what was just said. All right, and I realize that. Understand that I am trying to convey the heart that we see in Scripture of what Paul is saying. Because I am trying to be respectful of time. That probably deserves way more talking points. And I just threw it out there like a big stake into a lion pit. All right? And some people might be like, oh, you're getting an email this week. <laughs> all right. I'll use Kyle's joke. My email is Corey at rlcmn.church. <laughs> All right, take everything that was said. I want to boil it down into this. We run our race expecting obstacles. All right, we don't necessarily try and fight against them. We don't try and get rid of them. We don't try and like do all these different things and worry just about the obstacles in our life. Even though oftentimes we do. Think about our prayer life. How often is our prayer praying for these to disappear? Pretty often. Is that a bad prayer? Probably not. But we focus so heavily on that. Instead, what, what if our perspective changed and we saw these as growing opportunities and we said, God, give me the right perspective to see what's happening, to see how you're moving in this situation. All right? And the second part of this, so we run our race expecting obstacles and we fight to remove obstacles from others. That's, that's, that's a change. Often we fight to remove obstacles from our life. I'm saying, no, we don't do that. We fight to remove obstacles from others' lives. All right, in the morning on Sundays, we get together, everyone that's serving, all the volunteers, and we have a volunteer meeting. And, and a little thing that, illustration that I've said quite a few times is this. Every person that walks through our doors has some amount of a wall between them and God. Right? Like probably even most of us in this room, maybe your wall is small enough that it's not a big deal. But we have some type of wall between us and God. And that wall is filled with all sorts of bricks. Bricks that maybe we have put there. Bricks that Christians have put there. They walk through the doors of a church and they say, I had a Christian treat me this way. And that's a massive brick between them and God. I had a church and they hurt me they hurt me this way, and that's another brick in between them and God. And they have this wall. And our job as volunteers, we say this in our meeting, our job as volunteers is to remove every brick that we possibly can so that they can experience God. That's what our role is. It's the same idea as this. We fight to remove obstacles that might be in between us and somebody else.
Too often we ignore how our actions impact the world around us in a negative way. We need to be more aware of that. Too often we have expectations for other people walking through the doors of a church trying to find Jesus. And those expectations might be unrealistic or or even unbiblical. So let's get the right mindset this morning. Let's be dedicated to this. Let's put in the work like an athlete would put in the work and be thinking about how, how we maybe unintentionally have put barriers in front of others. Now I want to I wanna pray. We're reaching the end here. We're going to close in prayer. But I want to do this. Just kind of, can we just close our eyes in this room? And for a moment here, I want to pray over a couple different groups of us. The first one would be this. How many of you are in the room and you would say that there, there are some major hurdles in your life? All right, maybe you've had a, a really crummy situation that you've been walking through. Maybe there's something from the past. But you would say, right now, I'm running my race the best I can. I'm trying to live for Jesus, but there are some major hurdles and I am exhausted. How many of you guys would say that that's you? I'm not going to ask you what your hurdle is, anything like that. Yep, yep, a lot of hands. And I want to pray over that group in just a moment. How many of us would say, you know what, as I think about this, I I might have some areas in my life where I have caused hurdles for other people around me, and I need to rethink the way that I do things, say things, live things out. Is there anyone in the room that would say, that's me, and I need to stop putting hurdles up for others? Yep, yeah. And last group that wasn't in my notes, but just from this last analogy, how many of you guys feel like maybe you have have a hurdle, you have a brick wall, whatever you want to call it, in between you and God, and you're struggling with some stuff. You're struggling to make this connection with God, understand where you are at in this relationship. How many of you guys would say that's you? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I, I want to pray. Can you, especially if you raise your hand, can you pray along with me as we just pray over these things? Can all of us in this room... God, we we give these to you, Lord. God, I pray for rest. I pray for for energy. I pray for strength for those that feel like they are facing hurdles in their life. God, these situations, Lord, I pray that you would would cause good things to come out of this situation. God, give us the right perspective to see that in our lives. Jesus, we pray that you would just intervene in these situations. God, lower the hurdle, remove the hurdle, give us the strength to get over the hurdle, whatever it is that you have for us, whatever situation is best in your plan, that you would just do that in our life. Jesus, I pray for for those of us that feel like maybe we've done a poor job of removing obstacles from others, and and maybe we've gone as far as, as accidentally or purposefully throwing hurdles in front of others. God, I, I, right now, we just come to you, we, we repent of that, and we just say, God, help us live this out in a way that we can truly help others find you and not be a hindrance to them. And God, we pray for those that feel like there's something between you and them right now. God, I pray that that wall would just begin to be removed. Whatever is in those bricks, whatever is causing that wall to be there, God, I pray that that as we gather as the body of Christ, that we would see that in others. We would help them out. We would be there for them. We would help remove those bricks. Jesus, we want to be focused solely on you. Last thing before we go, if you're here this morning, maybe, maybe you've never had an opportunity to say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to live for him. I don't want to try and do this on my own. I'm trying to run this race on my own, and I need help. If that's you, and you want to say, I I want to live for Jesus, I want to make that decision today, I want to change my life. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up?
this is a decision that you have questions on, you're maybe wondering about what this would look like, please get together with me. Let's talk about it. I'm not going to force you into anything or, or try and get you to, to do something you don't want to do. Like, We just want to answer questions. We want to be there for people. We want to help remove those bricks. Let's close in prayer together. God, this morning, we give this time to you. We give today to you. God, I pray that you would give us unique opportunities today, that we would see those opportunities for what they are. God, if they are bad situations, that we would learn from them. God, that we'd have the right mindset that we aren't just taken down every single time an obstacle comes in our way. God, we pray that this week would be a week of growth and learning. God, would be a week of people finding you. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen.